Hello and welcome to My Two Cents, a show where I just share my opinion on a multitude of topics. Today's topic is that I'll say is our character designing in Mary Sue's. Now, I know this topic has been done to death, but I feel like I can bring something to the table that I haven't heard anyone else mention, so stick around and you might hear something new. To those of you who are new to the topic of Mary Sue's, I'll try to briefly explain what most people assume a Mary Sue to be. Most commonly, people will perceive a poorly designed character as a Mary Sue without even looking at the description of said character. By poorly designed, I mean that these characters usually have unappealing color palettes and little thought put into the function of their design. Examples would be characters that are rainbow colored or have bright clashing neon colors on them, have too many details on them, which most of them do not make sense or are not explained, making it hard to tell what the character is even meant to be. Sometimes the character can have as little as two colors, but it's usually black and another overly saturated color, like red or green. If you get past the design part, the bio is the next point at which people will call out a character for being a Mary Sue. The two most common extremes of a perceived Mary Sue's are A. A character that is wonderful in every way, is loved by all and has no racial flaws, making them bland and uninteresting. Due to the lack of defining traits that are not just skin deep, these characters often change their tune depending on the situation, making them inconsistent. And B. A dark broody character with a tragic past to make them seem more adult or serious, but come off as needlessly tragic to the point where they're just begging for pity or attention. Both of these types are often barely and fairly overpowered in the setting they are placed and defeat their foes with relative ease. Like I said, these two examples are the extremes, meaning that they are characters that can possess traits from both of these stereotypes or only some of them and still fit the Mary Sue label. Okay, so we have established what most people perceive as a Mary Sue, but what if I tell you that these are not the traits that make a Mary Sue? So what does a Mary Sue make? I have one word for you. Execution. No, not the choppy head of kind of execution, the how you portray the character through storytelling and interactions kind of execution. Although bad design and bias are often traits of a Mary Sue, they are usually the symptoms of a character being one, and not the cause. Both the design and character description importance pales in comparison to the character's execution. With great execution, you can make any silly costume or premise work. Take One Punch Man as a great example of that. A guy in a silly costume with powers unrivaled in this universe or any other to our knowledge goes out and defeats any foe with just one punch, without much effort. This has all the opportunities to fail and sink into an uninteresting Mary Sue zone, but the great execution of the premise, with the writers and animators knowing what they are doing, the show has become a great hit. And even if you are not a fan, you have to admit that the show has been insanely successful. What's even more inspiring about the show is its humble beginnings. Starting off as little more than a poorly drawn webcomic, it goes to prove my point that execution is what will make your character and story shine in the end. Sure, great art can often mask many flaws, but it can only go so far before people start noticing that something is seriously off. But if you handle the character and story wisely, it's a lot easier for people to put aside their distaste in the art style than it is for them to really strain their suspension of disbelief. Personally, I was originally turned off by Madoka Magica's design of the characters, but boy am I glad to get over that hill in the end. It was a wonderfully executed anime that I would definitely recommend to anyone who hasn't seen it yet. Another example of how important execution is to a character or a story is Batman. Now, I find Batman to be very interesting in the sense that throughout all of his incarnations in the media, he has the same base premise. A rich boy whose parents get murdered, thus he grows up to become a playboy billionaire that dons a costume and goes out at night to do some vigilante justice. Batman has been insanely successful as a franchise and it's no wonder he gets brought back over and over in cartoons and movies. However, not all of the movies and cartoons are equally successful. But why? Here we have a clearly defined and established character with the exact same backstory and mo motives each time and yet we get varying results. The answer here is, my dear viewers, is of course execution. Each writer, each director, each actor, each animator have their own interpretation of Batman and their own ideas of how the character should work. In each reincarnation of him, we see a different execution of the same character and although yes, the costume changes too, I think what really affects the fans' opinion of the creation is how the given piece of media handles the character. Batman the Animated Series is often seen as the best reincarnation of the character, while the movie Batman and Robin is consistently listed as one of the worst movies, so it goes to show you that depending on who and how is handling a story and a character, it can be a great success or a huge flop. 
So now that you know what really makes a Mary Sue, it's time to talk on how you can avoid making one. Yes, I did point out that the description and art aren't as important as the execution, but having a decent design and a fluent description will certainly help things. Now, giving advice on this is difficult since no hard rules really exist. In the hands of someone talented, even the worst sounding premise and the most poorly designed characters can be made into something really good. But not everyone is a prodigy and I think a good rule of thumb when it comes to art is that you should know and master the rules before you go and break them. So here are a few, um, rather than rules, let's call them guidelines. 1. Make your character fit the setting. Do you want to have a magically superpowered girl that goes to high school and has friends that are also superpowered girls? That is perfectly fine, and such characters would work well in any magical girl anime or a comic. A setting they would not fit into would be something like a post-apocalyptic wasteland or simply a world that has already been established as a world without magic. There is nothing stopping you from making a story about magical girls in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, however, I totally read that thing. But if you are making a fan character, you should respect the property you are inserting your character in. If you are just going to change it to your own preferences, you might as well just make an original setting that is loosely based on an existing property, or at the very least, make it an alternate universe. I do not want to mark this as some sort of hard rule though, because some settings lend themselves to the possibilities of one's imagination. Like the My Little Pony world is filled with mythological creatures that are usually based on Greek mythology, but have featured things from other mythologies too. Who's to say it can't have something of a pony equivalent of a kitsune, a fox spirit from Japanese lore? Or something else that we have yet to see in canon, it is equally magical as any other featured creature, and could very well fit in. There is nothing wrong with being creative and pushing some limits, but be smart about it and be respectful. I think a strict no-no would be to deliberately go against what has been already established in the universe, solely to make your character more special and unique. There are many ways to make your characters interesting and unique, you do not have to go and break canon for that purpose alone. 2. Be mindful of who your character is. Really think through what motivates your character to do what they do, what drives them, what influences their way of thinking. A thing I dislike that people do is throwing in a mental disorder to their character as some sort of shorthand for personality trait and they never really do research what it really means to be a person that has to live with that mental disorder. It is not wrong to have a character with a mental disorder, but do not just throw it into your character's bio the same way you just throw in, oh and they also like strawberries. I think a good practice is to first design a character and explore who they are. Find out how and why they do things the way they do without grabbing for a mental illness as an excuse. And when that is done, if you really want to tag on a mental illness, do research to see if their actions and behavioral symptoms match up with those of the illness you want to use. If they don't, then don't do it. Your character doesn't have to have mental problems to somehow be justified in their actions, and you do not have to force people to sympathize with said character by creating a shallow reason for the readers to feel sorry for them. So please, please be mindful when you tack on mental disabilities onto characters. Know what and why you are doing this. I'd also like to note that I do have characters with mental disorders, but I rarely state them outright. I do not like the labels to be seen as some sort of badges they wear, so instead of saying the mental disorder, I describe how the character behaves, how they react to things, so on and so forth. I feel like this approach will give readers a better understanding of what your character is about and who they are as a person, it is also more fun to connect the dots through context rather than being told outright. After all, we have so many fan theories all over the internet about established characters and their possible mental states. That just goes to prove that show don't tell is a rule that can really work in this context to grab a reader's interest. 3. Be consistent. I feel like this ties in with my last point a little. It is very important for any character to have their own established personalities and actually sticking to them. By knowing your character, you can more easily tell how they would react to a given situation. If all your characters react the same to the same situations, then that's not good. What's worse if a character acts one way in one situation, but then when it's faced later with a similar situation, acts a different way that contradicts their established personality. Example, we have a character that, let's say, has been established to really like mice. Because in one scenario, they refused to kill off a mouse that was causing trouble. Instead of killing it, they decided to save it and then set it free somewhere else. They went through a lot of trouble to do that, when it would have been easier to just get rid of the mouse by killing it. Then, a few chapters later, the character finds themselves in a big abandoned castle and sees a few mice scurrying around. They go, ew, pests, and then proceed to swat at them with a broom to make them go away, potentially risking injury to them. Do you see how the second scenario would not fit a character that had been set up in the first scenario? This was made to be pretty easy to tell, but not all stories are so simple, so it is important to keep track of your character's motivations and what influences them. 
The second scenario would be acceptable if, let's say, the character had lost their memory, the mouse they had saved in the first scenario then somehow betraying them and causing harm, making the character regret their earlier stance and changing it to the test mice, and other stuff like that. Being consistent does not mean being static, it just means that you have to have your character follow a natural progression. Do not have them spontaneously develop a skill that they were previously shown to not possess, try not to give them new powers out of the Vuasu, and the like. It's okay to have them learn new skills or discover new powers, but make it make sense, establish the hows and whys. Sometimes it doesn't have to be directly before they show up their new skill or power. Set up a Chekhov's gun, those are always fun if done properly. If you're not familiar with the phrase Chekhov's gun, I suggest googling it. Anyway, I feel like this video has gotten pretty long as it is and I could probably go on for a few more hours, but I think I'll wrap it up here. I hope you have found my video to be interesting and if you have anything you'd like to share, add or correct me on, feel free to leave a comment down below. Also, I would like to take a moment to thank my current patrons for supporting me. I currently have no rewards set up so the fact that they are actually supporting me is really, really touching. Thank you all very, very much. If you are interested in also supporting me, I will provide a link in the description. Thank you for watching, mage out!